Okay, I think we're ready to get started. So hello everyone and welcome. On behalf of the PHRC commissioners, senior management and staff, I would like to thank you all for joining us today for the first of several 2022 PHRC Women's History Month programs. My name is Laura Argenbreit and I'm the Director of Communications for the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission. We are delighted today to welcome our distinguished Emmy Award winning keynote presenter, Juju Chang, who Stacey Waters will introduce to you in a few moments. First, of course, I have a few housekeeping tips. We ask that you remain on mute throughout the program. If time allows, there will be a few moments for questions at the end of the presentation. This, record, this program is being recorded and live streamed on Facebook. So just so you're aware, we operate on a basic Zoom meeting module. We're all in the same room. So it's very important that you stay on mute and you're also aware of your on-screen presence throughout the recording. And one last piece before we get started today, um, I would like to thank our um, closed captioner, Max Body, and our ASL interpreters who are provided by DHI, Hetty, and Jenna. Thank you, you guys always do such a great job for us. So today, we'd like to start our Women's History Month program with a beautiful poem recited, recited oh, I did it. by oh, Zuli Roja, I'm sorry, Zulai Roja, a clerk typist and valued staff member from our Philadelphia Regional Office. Take it away, Zulai. Thank you so much, Laura, I appreciate it. Can everyone hear me? We Hello. Can. We can. Okay, wonderful. So I will be reciting Won't You Be My Sister by Amanda Gorman. Mark me a ripple. Make me a piercing drop, a froth at the lip of a wave, just so I can be but a note in the roar of this crescent ocean. Name me breath. Know me as air dancing nude in the treetops just so I can be but a sigh in the cry of this changing wind. Call me heat, claim me red, a flash writhing in fervor, just so I can be but a spark in the pulse of a newborn flame. Hear me as woman, have me as your sister on purple battlefield breaking day, so I may say, our victory is just beginning, that you and I are women, no longer trying to woo men, holding the truth to be self-evident that all genders are created equal. See me as change. Say I am movement, that I am the year, and I am the era of the women. Thank you. Thank you, Zulai. That was wonderful. And you are and we are. What a great day for this program today. Next, it's my pleasure to introduce PHRC's Executive Director, Chad Dion Lassiter. Chad, in addition to being our leader here at PHRC, is a national expert on voice on and, and voice on race relations. In addition to many humanitarian endeavors, he founded Black Men at Penn School of Social Work, Inc. at the University of Pennsylvania, where he also earned two master's degrees. In 2021, Executive Director Laster was honored as a recipient of the Pennsylvania Social Worker of the Year Award given by the National Association of Social Workers Pennsylvania Chapter. Most recently, E.D. Lassiter was named to the City and State 2022 Power of Diversity Black 100 list. E.D. Lassiter, would you please provide a few opening remarks? Thank you so much, Laura. Happy Women's Day to everyone. Uh, good afternoon and welcome. Uh, on behalf of our PHRC commissioners, my senior management team, and our PHRC staff, welcome to our Women's History Month event. And also welcome to our beloved community. We are excited and honored that we, are, we have joining with us today, Juju Chang. In our democracy and in Pennsylvania in particular, oftentimes it seems like hate is winning. 
However, today we say to hate, come in and have a seat. Hate, meet love. Hate, meet truth. Hate, meet kindness. And hate, get ready to meet Juju Chang as we address how to stop Asian American Pacific Islander hate in the Commonwealth and in our democracy. Once again, to everyone in this beautiful, beloved community on this gorgeous, bombing day here in our Commonwealth, happy Women's History Month and welcome. Thank you so much, Chad. You always have just the perfect comments that inspire us all. Next, we're going to hear from PHRC's Director of Enforcement, Kurt Jung, who will talk a little bit about our AAPI initiatives. Director Jung? Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Laura. It's such a, a great day to, to be here and, and with you. And I'm so excited to meet um, Juju Chang. We, we, as Asian Americans, we're so proud to, to, to meet with you and, and hear you. Um, I saw your special and I was just amazed by, the, by about a, Asian um, hate. Um, it's, it's sort of something that someone's is someone actually is looking into and, and reporting out on this. Um, in our, in, uh, for the past several months, we've been meeting with um, age, people from the Asian American community, as well as, as American community, le Asian American community leaders. In the next few months, we're gonna be also doing some initiatives with them. Um, being in HRC, it's really important for us to be out there. Um, many of the things that are going on in the Asian communities, especially with the, the Asian attacks, attacks on Asian Americans or AAPI, uh, community members <clears throat> is is to have a place where they can come to, to to complain about these things, and they complain to their local leaders, they complain to their local churches, and sometimes it's hard to go to a government agency. So one of the things is we're doing is working with with those uh, community leaders to establish places where we can actually make those connections from our agency across the state of Pennsylvania. Throughout the last couple of years, we've been seeing a rise in the in the tax on Asian Americans. Even uh, just get close, getting close to home, I even had a, an 80-year-old person who was in my church came in one day with a black eye. And she, uh, she she came in and I said, "What happened?" And, and I was just shocked. And she was in her at her home in Chinatown in Philadelphia. And here, someone comes over and just and just sucker punches her, and it, it just broke my heart. Uh, knocked her on the ground. Uh, no one was around, and someone came actually had to come up and help her and pick her up. Um, and it, it's just shocking that they're they're attacking uh, a lot of the the people who are. Elderly, um, the people who are, are even even people who are in wheelchairs or disabled, the, the people who can't defend themselves or the can become the the, um, the victims of, of these these crimes. So as an HRC, we need to be very extra vigilant uh, in working with law enforcement as well as working with the community leaders so that uh, we can we can put an end to this hate. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Laura. Thank you, Director Jung. And now on to the main presentation. One of two educational outreach coordinators for the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission, Stacy Waters, will introduce our keynote speaker. Stacy, please do the honors. Thank you. Juju Chang is the Emmy Award winning co anchor of ABC News Nightline and a regular contributor to Good Morning America in 2020. With the rise of hate crimes against Asian American and Pacific Islander community, Chang leveraged her platform to become a much admired champion of social change. She made U.S. broadcast history co-anchoring the 2021 ABC News Live special, <clears throat> Stop the Hate, the Rise in Violence Against Asian Americans, alongside fellow Korean-American co-anchor Eva Pilgrim and a cast of AAPI journalists, thought leaders, lawmakers, and celebrities. Chang also reported from the scene of the mass shootings at three Asian-themed spas in Atlanta, co-anchoring the ABC, ABC News 2020 special Murder in Atlanta. Chang's highly visible reporting on Asian hate is the culmination of de decades of covering everything from natural disasters to terrorism, mass shootings, immigration, violence against the LGBTQIA plus community, and most recently, the inequities of the COVID-19 pandemic. Known for her in-depth 
personal narratives and long form storytelling, Chang has won acclaim for stories with underlying themes of civil and women's rights and social justice. These include her critical examination of the controversial Remain in Mexico immigration policy, which she told through the eyes of one pregnant woman and her family living among the 60,000 asylum seekers camped for months along the Rio Grande. Her award-winning report, Trans and Targeted on Violence Against Transgender Women of Color was the latest of the series of a series of stories targeting the LGBTQIA Americans, including a, gl a GLAD award-winning report on Matthew Shepard's murder. Internationally, Chang has been a powerful voice on gender-based violence, including a trip through South, or excuse me, a trip through Central Africa on the front lines against Boko Haram and Bring Back Our Girls. She also traveled to Honduras for Femicide, The Untold Story, an eye-opening look at rampant violence against women. In addition to reporting, Chang has profiled newsmakers like President Joe Biden, Oprah Winfrey, Facebook COO Sheryl Sandberg, entertainers such as Tom Hanks, Chris Pratt, Nicki Minaj, and social media moguls Kendra Jenner, Kendall Jenner and Dude Perfect. An ABC News veteran, Chang joined the network as an entry level desk assistant in 1987 after graduating with honors from Stanford University. Prior to her current roles at ABC, she was a producer for World News Tonight, a co, a co anchor on the overnight show World News Now, and a news anchor for Good Morning America. Chang's work has been recognized with numerous awards, including multiple Emmys, Gracie's, a DuPont, a Merle, and Peabody Awards. Born in Seoul, Korea, and raised in Northern California, Chang is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and a founding member of the Korean American Community Foundation. Please welcome Ms. Juju Chang. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Thank you so much. What you couldn't see just slightly off screen, and thank you Chad earlier and Kurt for your wonderful inspiration as well. What you couldn't see just off screen is my husband trying to get um, a charging cable for me so that I wouldn't you know, have my battery die in the middle of this. I'm having a little bit of a Zoom snafu, but you know, as my father-in-law used to say to me all the time, that's the news biz. Uh, and I'm thrilled to be here with you guys today. I mean, to be completely honest, my brain has been full of the Ukraine crisis and the details and the harrowing stories and the, the incredibly gut-wrenching tales that are coming out of that war conflict zone. And so it is actually really a pleasure to be able to turn my attention back to so many of the issues here at home that continue to roil our 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 workplaces, our corporate spheres, our personal communities, and frankly, what you guys do at the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission affects so many of us day in and day out. And it's such a vital work that you all do, um, fighting against discrimination and housing and commercial property, education. I was reading your website and I was like, this is such a cool group. I'm so happy to be here with you today. You know, we are really though watching the fight for freedom, the fight for democracy unfolding in this incredibly dramatic nuclear tinged conflict between, you know, two superpowers in, in Ukraine. And yet during this past week, I interviewed um, Lieutenant Colonel Vindmind. He's the um, Ukrainian American official at NSC who um, was the one who was on the phone call with President Trump to the Ukrainian President Zelensky. And he's the one who reported that, you know, he felt like 
that the U.S. was, you know, threatening to withhold military aid in Ukraine in exchange for digging up dirt on Joe Biden, on domestic politics. And yet at the same time, he said, look, the Republicans and Joe Biden's administration has also been on autopilot on some level because Ukraine has been radioactive and that in many ways that weakened Ukraine vis-a-vis Russia. And so this is a, an instance in which domestic policies impacted our foreign policy. And yet at the same time, I worry that when the entire global uh, crisis fixates everyone's attention on foreign policy, that sometimes domestic policy gets short shrift. And so, you know, I'm really happy to be able to dig into these issues that you all work with on a day to day basis. Um, I think at a time when people's eyes are off of domestic issues, it's the time that we need to reflect even more deeply on what brought us to where we are today. I know that for me, three decades of storytelling have culminated in the kinds of stories that I focused on last year about the rise in anti-Asian hate. And it's what Kurt was referring to. It's like everyday vulnerable Asian Americans being attacked on the street for, for what is essentially racialized or stereotyped um, untruths about Asian Americans. And so I wanna to talk today about what is it in our culture that these messages are getting to those few people who would go out and resort to these kinds of physical attacks, right? What is it in our, our social fabric uh, that, that doubles down sometimes on these stereotypes? So let's go back to the early days of the dark days of 2020 during the pandemic, right? When we first were, were learning about this scary virus um, called COVID-19. And I, I spent those first early months interviewing scientists and doctors and epidemiologists and frontline workers and essential workers. And, you know, um, we, I went into hotspots in Queens and the Bronx and I started seeing like the rest of the world, the racial disparity with COVID, right? With infection rates, hospitalization rates and death rates that were far dramatically different, right? To me, the racial divide of COVID exposed something um, that you couldn't unsee, right? And in many ways, we all got a chance to see, you know, why it was that these, these living and outcome disparities were affected by the neighborhoods that you live in, the color of your skin, and, and who you are, which is, is, is the height of injustice, right? And yet at the same time, we saw a really uh, opening, a bubbling up of public consciousness, you know, an awakening of sorts in the issue of racial reckoning when George Floyd was murdered. That happened in the same, you know, year, right? And people took to the streets. And I just remember covering those protests and looking around at the, the protesters on the streets and thinking, these protesters look like American, everyday Americans. There are grandmothers and there are allies. There are certainly African-American protesters, but there are white allies, there are Hispanic allies, there were plenty of Asian American allies, people in the LGBTQ community. And, and really it was this moment where people stood up and recognized this racial divide that we had been grappling with sort of in, in little flare ups over the years. So, you know, recently somebody asked me if there was something that I, that, that something about me I'd like to share that may not be sort of apparent at first glance. And I thought about Chadwick Boseman, you know, who played Black Panther, right? And you remember that when he died, so many of us in the world were shocked because he had privately been battling cancer, right? And I think it was a reminder to all of us that what you see on the outside doesn't always match what's going on on the inside, which is at the core concept of prejudice. Just hold on to your judgment when you see someone, when you meet someone, when you interact with someone. So when someone asked me, what's something about you that's not obvious? And I think for me, when I was a kid, here's what you wouldn't know by looking at me. I was a nationally ranked swimmer, right? And I spent so many of my days, six days a week in a pool. And I, it was my whole identity. It was who I was. Um, but by the time I was like 16 or so, I quit. And I put on a bunch of weight and I became really insecure about myself right? And I was 
one of those kids who grew up other anyways, because I grew up in Silicon Valley. I was born in Korea. And I remember growing up thinking my family's food smelled funny. You know, my parents were seen as talking funny. You know, I was reminded on the playground that I looked funny, right? So in so many ways, I felt other. I felt, you know, I didn't have words to describe these words. Like I was marginalized. I felt marginalized. I remember running errands with my dad and because he had a thick Korean accent, I noticed when I was just 12, 13, 15 years old, that people would treat him badly. You know, today's parlance would be a microaggression, right? But again, those weren't words that I understood. It was out and out racism that I was witnessing, but I didn't have words to attach to it, right? But because of those experience, I think I honed my superpower, the thing that you can't see when you, when you first meet me, and that is my empathy and my compassion. I think of it as my superpower, especially as a journalist, as I go out and tell other people's stories. I tend to be drawn over the past 30 years to stories about people who feel othered, about people who are marginalized, about people whose voice may not be as powerful as you know, corporate titans or political leaders. That's why, as you heard about my resume, you heard about me going to Honduras and talking about femicides, me going to Africa and doing the bring back our girls when Boko Haram kidnapped, me going to the border of Mexico um, when, when people were detained and not allowed to, to seek asylum politically. Oh, I went recently to Guatemala to, to look at the idea of climate migration, that, that, that severe climate droughts have caused um, such severe malnutrition that families will literally scrape together their entire life savings and pin their dreams on a 14 year old child and whether he can make it to the border of Mexico and become a dishwasher in the United States to keep his family alive in Guatemala. Those are the kinds of stories that I'm drawn to. That's who I am. And that is forged by the fact that I was raised Asian American and felt othered in this country. It makes me relate to other people's pain and suffering. And I think that you don't have to be a person of color. You don't have to be, you just have to be compassionate. You just have to have empathy. And, and I think right now, you know, when we go into these silos all the time that we, we talk about, you know, oh, are, is it BIPOC? Are you this, are you that? It, what it is, is you're a caring human being. And clearly that's what Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission focuses on, right? I am so grateful to be able to go out and talk about some of these issues. But for me, one of the culminations of my um, 30 year career was the huge spike in anti-Asian hate that happened during COVID, right? Um, the, what we saw was really a spike that was caused by words that were coming from the highest echelons of government, right? And, and I think a lot of times we need to focus on what is it, these cultural messages that you're getting. So one of the issues that Asian Americans face is something called the perpetual foreigner syndrome, right? It's the, it's the syndrome that like, I grew up primarily in the United States. I remember growing up thinking, I wanna be like a, a blonde California girl. Why do I have to, you know, look like this and be different. I remember going to sleep at night and putting scotch tape on my nose because somebody called me pie face, flat nose. And, and I didn't like the way that I looked, right? And so, and yet I went to Stanford University. I majored in political science. And, and I would still have people say to me, oh, um, you speak really good English. And I, and I would say, oh, I'd like a little bit shocked, right? Didn't quite know what to say. And, and what the subtext of that is, is you don't look like you're American. You don't look like you're from here, right? So I actually, over 20 years, developed a good comeback to that. If somebody says to me, oh, you speak really good English. And generally, the ten person tends to not be you know, from overseas or have a lot of overseas experience. I will sell it, thank you, so do you. Because you wouldn't make that comment to a white person. You would say that only to somebody you perceive at first glance to be a foreigner. And that is the, the sort of slight undertone. And, and to understand me, I right see Kurt Jung is saying, where are you from, right? That's, that's the question, the perpetual foreigner. Friend, where are you from? And I would say to people, oh, I'm from California. Then no, 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 where are you really from? And I'd say, oh, you know, I'm 
live in New York. That's, you know, cause I'm kind of playing with them and making them understand what they're saying because I think humor helps, right? I don't think people mean to be malicious but I like to point out to them with the thank you, so do you that they're what they're holding on to. And maybe they could learn from that interaction, right? And the subtext of where are you from is that you're not from here. You don't look American, right? And I think that is what America, Asian Americans struggle for. And you think, well, what, what's the big deal? Nobody really means anything by that. And the truth is what ends up happening is that slight bias, that unconscious bias, right? That we've all discussed can be weaponized when you are dealing with a pandemic, the likes of which none of us have ever seen in our lifetime, right? Think about the economic dislocation. We all were in our pajamas Zooming within two weeks. We were, you know, our lives were upside down. Some people lost jobs, some people lost loved ones. This was a cataclysmic occurrence, right? And yet what was weaponized was the Wuhan virus the China flu. We heard leaders of the free world saying, you know, that it was caused by China. And what ended up happening, and again, this goes back to this idea of subtle cultural messages, that people started getting the message that anybody who looked like this was responsible for the pandemic. You're like, well, that's crazy. Who would act out on that kind of subtle cultural messaging? Well, the truth is we saw an explosive spike in anti-Asian hate, right? It was no coincidence. In June of 2020, within three months, they marked 2,100 anti-Asian hate incidents, right? They were reported to advocacy groups and, uh, and law enforcement and, uh, and academic groups. All of the numbers are, forget it. Somebody yelled something at me as I was driving and said something like, go back to China. I'm not from China, but whatever. Let's not quibble when someone's being racist at you. Um, the bottom line is, most of those reports are the few tip of the iceberg reports where people bother to stop on their way to work and contact law enforcement, explain their story, you know, only perhaps to be minimized, right? And so we know that those numbers don't really reflect all of what's going on. And if you wonder, oh, well, maybe it's not really related to the Wuhan virus thing that was going on. If you dig down into some of these 832 police reports that academics went through in California alone, there were anti-Asian slurs that literally used the phrases that were being puppeted by leaders, right? Um, there was one assailant in uh, San Francisco at a hardware store. He was told, you know, go back to China, bring your disease with you. A woman was putting her child in a car seat and, and someone threw a beer bottle at her and said, go home, you know, and, and a racial slur and Wuhan virus, right? And these were attacks that have quieted down in some ways in the mainstream media, but they are happening to this day it, it, as much as it has a year ago. They haven't stopped. Just yesterday, the NYPD arrested a 28-year-old white suspect who in the matter of two hours attacked seven different women of Asian descent over the weekend. He punched several in the face. He sent two to the hospital. It's like what Kurt was saying about they're often the most vulnerable they're often older, weaker. What is it about these cultural messages? This man was charged with seven counts of assault and attempted assault and charged with a hate crime. And we can talk further about why historically it's so difficult to get hate crimes charges when it comes to Asian Americans. And part of that is this language, this nomenclature, right? Um, unfortunately, we know what the words are um, when, you're, when you're talking about a hate crime involving other um, racial backgrounds or ethnic backgrounds. With Asian Americans, is it enough to say Wuhan virus? Is it enough to say go home to China? Like what constitutes, right, um, an, an anti-Asian hate crime? And what if the witnesses don't speak English? What if the, 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 the person who's being attacked doesn't have perfect understanding of English? What if the person being attacked doesn't have the proper, um, you know, is not properly documented, you know, and is undocumented? 
how reluctant are they going to be to report these crimes that are being committed against them? There are so many sticking points in the AAPI community about this rise in anti-Asian attacks, not to mention the cultural history and baggage, frankly, that the Asian Americans bring from their homelands um, where they don't trust authorities, right? They don't trust police. They don't go to police. And the last thing they want to do is, is invite you know, retribution, right? So the other aspect of it that I really think about a lot is when you drill down into any one of these cases, what you often find is a long criminal record and often a mental health break. So I interviewed a woman named Wilma Carey, and she was the woman who was attacked in Manhattan in front of a high rise building. And the hallmark of her attack was that the lobby guards were seen on surveillance camera closing the doors as she was being attacked and kind of washing their hands of it. The, the building later said that, you know, that clip was taken out of context. But what happened to her was she was attacked by a man, kicked, her pelvis was broken, stomped on the head. Um, and he said to her, you know, um, you effing, you know, uh, Asian person, um, go away, go home to China, you don't, belong here. And Vilma and her daughter decided to take those words and take this horrific crime and turn it on its head. And they got a lot of money on GoFundMe and they decided to um, invest in a pop-up museum piece. And they took his words, you don't belong here. And they created an exhibit called AAP I Belong. And they collected stories of belonging of Asian Americans, and they printed them out into this beautiful pop-up museum space. And I thought it was such a brilliant way of turning hate into something constructive, right? But when you drill down into the attacker, you realize he had a criminal record. He had just gotten out of prison for killing his own mother, right? This is a man who was having a severe mental health break when he attacked her, but he somehow picked up these messages of anti-Asian hate in the midst of carrying out this particularly heinous crime. So when I interviewed Vilma, I said, you know, you, I know you were heading to St. Patrick's Cathedral that day. Did you ever make it? And she said, you know, I did. It was recently my 60th birthday. I went to St. Catherine's Cathedral and I said, just kind of off the top of my head, I said, so what did you pray for? And she said, you know, I prayed prayers of gratitude for all of the love and all of the well wishes and all of the get well packages that I had received from so many people. And she was sitting there next to her daughter who had helped start this I, AAPI I Belong um, Foundation. And then she turned to her daughter and said, turned to me and she said, and then I prayed for my attacker. And I thought, wow, I remember like even telling you guys now I'm getting goosebumps, right? And I, I, I was stunned. I'm sure if you saw my face, my jaw would have been open. And I said, what, why, why did you do that? And she said, because whatever he was going through in that moment, I wanted to give him grace. I wanted to understand and I wanted him to, I wanted to send him that peace. And I thought to myself, wow, I mean, I was blown away. And I said to her after recovering myself and, you know, maybe closing my jaw, I said, you know what, Vilma, here's the thing. I've been doing these kinds of stories for 30 years and I know enough about whether you put it into a philosophical perspective or you put it into a psychological perspective or you put it into a religious spiritual perspective. What I know is that that act of forgiveness does more to empower the person doing the forgiving as much as it does the person for whom grace is giving, right? And to me, I thought in that moment, and I said out loud, Vilma, you are literally fighting hate with love. And she was, she sort of sparkled and she said, oh, I think you're right. And I think that is the message and that is the moment that we're at because yes, these attacks continue. Yes, there's a tremendous amount of mistrust, dis distrust, you know, and I think that that continues for a long time. And there's so much that we have to learn. I mean, one of the things that I think 
I talked about the perpetual foreigner idea. The other assumption about Asian Americans is that is harmful, I think, is the model minority myth, right? And you think, well, I've had friends say, well, what's wrong with the minor model minority myth? People think that you're you're smart and you're great. What's wrong with that, Juju? And I'll say, here's the problem with that. Sure, some percentage of Asian Americans do really well and they, but not all Asian Americans go to Ivy League schools. I hate to break it to you. Not all Asian Americans are straight A students. Not all Asian Americans are crazy rich Asians. In fact, 18% of Asian Americans, Koreans live in poverty in New York City. And if that percentage sounds high to you, it's because it is high. It's higher than Hispanic Americans. Nine out of the last 12 years, Asian Americans have a higher poverty rate in New York than African Americans, right? This is really something that renders Asian Americans invisible. You know, these are the invisible Asian Americans that deliver Chinese food dinner to you or who do your nails in the nail salon or clean your clothes and the dry cleaner or or work in the corner deli seven days a week with their children and grandchildren working 20 hours a day to keep that little deli open or who work in the gas station the bangladeshi gas station guy down the street or the you know the the korean american dry cleaner or the who these folks are in many ways overshadowed and rendered invisible by this model minority myth that again, like any myth, like any stereotype has an ounce of truth to it, but, but then renders everybody else invisible. And, and the other thing for this, for your group, you know that that also means that, I'm trying to find the um, statistic here, here it is. Asian Americans make up 15% of the greater New York population, and yet they receive less than 2% of social services. And a lot of that is because Asian Americans are rendered invisible or they don't have access to the levers of power, whether it's on the city level, the federal level, non-governmental organizations, nonprofits, they just have a harder time at outreach, it's cultural, it's linguistic, it's all those things that make it difficult, right, for, for Asian Americans to access these levers of power. I'm trying to keep an eye on the clock because I'm trying to finish up by two so that we can have Q&A after this. I'm, I'm, I really want you to stay on and have Q&A. One of the things for me um, that was a, a flip the switch moment is it's almost been one year. In fact, it's one year, March 16th. Um, seven women and uh, let's see, eight people were killed at three different Asian themed spas in Atlanta, right? Two non-Asian bystanders were also killed, right? And I think that that was a waking, a wake up call for the Asian American community. A 21 year old white gunman went into three of these different spas and, and just opened fire. When police interviewed him afterwards, he told them that he had a sex addiction that he wanted to eliminate his problem. And one sheriff, not Atlanta PD, but one of the county sheriffs afterwards came out, and gave a press conference. And he said, um, less than 24 hours after the shootings had happened, he said, you know, um, this is this case, this murder spree is not about race. It's about sex. And yet Asian American advocates were like, wait, wait, hold on, hold the phone. If you go to three Asian themed spas and kill six Asian or Asian American women, how is that not racialized in some way, right? Asian activists I talk to say you cannot eliminate race when you're talking about these racist tropes. And I'm coming to the third one now, which is the hypersexualization of Asian and Asian American women, right? It is a stereotype. And kind of like model minority, I've had friends say to me, well, what's wrong with that, Juju? They just find you attractive. What's wrong? And the truth is, like model minority, it's like it isn't flattering when it is dehumanizing. I've sat at bars, and this was a long time ago because, you know, I'm no spring chicken. But like years ago, I would have men come up to me and say like, oh, you're just my type. You're a, a lotus flower. One guy actually said that. Now, I give men a lot of grace and I'm using some humor because you know, sometimes it's not easy to walk up to a woman in a bar. Maybe they've had a little too much liquid courage. But the bottom line is why that makes people go, ooh, is because it's dehumanizing. You're not seeing me as a human. You're seeing me as a racial stereotype. 
right? And that is damaging. It's dehumanizing. And that is why a man can walk into three different Asian themed spas and say, this isn't about race. This is about sex. So it's really something that we need to deconstruct, right? When I went down to Atlanta, and this was the hour long special that you guys heard about, we recently won a Gracie award for it. We're nominated for a number of awards. I'm deeply proud of it. Part of the reason why I was so proud is that I felt like you know, listen, I had been to the Newtown shooting in, in Connecticut, the, the Vegas shooting in Las Vegas, the Pulse shooting in Florida. I sadly am experienced at talking to people who are in the grappling with the grips of this kind of horrific violence, right? But I also had the cultural literacy of understanding what sex work means in many ways, the human trafficking of it all, the desperation of it all, right? To give these women the dignity that they deserved. I talked to one woman's um, daughter, right? She was the daughter of one of the spa owners. And she told me this heartbreaking story about her mother. She immigrated from China. She had worked six days a week for her entire time here in the United States. She saved up money. She ate from a rice cooker in the back so she could save her pennies so she could go to spa, therapy and get her massage license, right? She scrapes all her money together. She opens this massage car. She has signs on every room that says no sex. Anytime somebody was trying to do something underhanded, she called the police. All of her friends said this was not uh, uh, someone who was engaged in sex work. Not that there's anything wrong with it, but she wasn't, right? And this daughter said, you know, I was, I was so upset. Not only was my mother killed, everyone assumes she's, you know, a sex worker, right? The other victim's family member I spoke to was a man by the name of Randy Park. And he was about 22 when I sat down with him. And all I could see was my son, because my, I have a 21 year old son. And I'm thinking, what would he do if his mother were killed? Like he's coherent. He's talking to me. Um, his mother had raised him and his younger brother a single mom. They had struggled financially. In fact, during the pandemic, the, the spa her, his mother worked at shut down. And so he was working in a bakery and giving her extra money so that they could make rent, the three of them. It was the three of them against the world. When he was a little kid, he told me, I thought my mom worked at a nail salon. But when I got older, I understand. And he referred to this place as shady. And he said one day he confronted her about the work that she was doing. And he said, I understood that it was sketchy. And so I said, what was that conversation like? And he looked me in the eye and this was 48 hours after he'd lost his mother to a murderer. And he looked me in the eye and he said, would you tell your son if you worked in that kind of spa? And I sat there and I knew what I would say but I couldn't as a journalist. And instead I said, that's a really good question. He said that in that conversation, when he confronted her, he said that he was mad at her because he had, she had lied to him. He was old enough to be upset about that. He said he was mad at her because he said to her, I want you to stay safe, right? And, and after the sheriff came out and said, this wasn't about race, this was about sex. Randy Park gave an interview uh, to a reporter and he, and the headline was, I call bullshit on the sheriff. That was the headline. And he felt that con the conflation of just any woman equals sex worker was racist. And he called that out. Then he opened a GoFundMe account and he said what he told, what I told you, which is they were struggling financially. He wasn't sure if he could pay rent. Could you please maybe give us a little bit of help so I could pay for my mom's funeral expenses and not be kicked out of our little townhouse. Within 48 hours, Randy Park got $1.7 million. While I sat with him, it just went through the roof even further. And you think to yourself, what? I mean, this is an era when $10,000 is a lot, $100,000 is a lot. Add a zero and multiply and you get what Randy got. In fact, I looked it up the other day and it was closer to $3 million now. Why? Why was there such an outpouring for Randy Park and what he said? And I think when I went through the GoFundMe page and I scrolled through the donations and looked at who was sending and what were they sending, it wasn't big dollar donations. It was $25 from 
Scranton, Pennsylvania. It was $50 from, you know, Texas. It was 150, 70, 20. And the messages were all searingly similar. The message was, or all, I see you, Randy. I see your mother's struggle. I'm sorry for your loss, Randy. I know what it was like to have my parents give up everything and make all sorts of sacrifices for me. I'm so sorry, Randy. I'm like crying thinking about these messages because basically what they were responding to was this struggling single mother immigrant doing whatever it takes to put food on the children's table. And that's what dishwashers at the restaurant do. That's what gas station, you know, Bangladeshi families do. That's what my parents did, even though they had a master's degree in English literature. My mother was scrubbing toilets to make sure that we were going to be okay. And that is the classic immigrant struggle that most people can relate to in some way. They've heard stories of Grandma Nona coming from Italy and struggling, right? That is the American dream. And that is what this younger generation of AAPIs are out on the streets talking about. I mentioned that during the George Floyd protests, I saw a lot of AAPI you know, protesters more than I'd ever seen before. And I was surprised, you know, what they did in galvanizing in AAPI against AAPI hate was very similar to what they learned, I think, in being allies uh, with African-Americans. And I think now is the time for people who are subjected to what I said at the beginning, this idea of being marginalized, this idea of being other, um, to, to, to unite under the banner of fighting against hate as Vilma Carey did in the name of love, in the name of mutual understanding and mutual humanity, that we can see um, uh, people fleeing tyranny and terror in Ukraine and see their humanity, right? And hope that we can see the same humanity in the 17 year old kid who's fleeing Guatemala because his family's life depends on him. And that we can see the humanity and the migrants leaving Syria and trying to find, you know, uh, dignity and, and opportunities for their families, you know, throughout Europe. And so these are the kinds of, uh, you know, galvanizing moments where you see other people's humanity. And that is how we fight the stereotyping, the racism the hate that we all have seen in so many different varieties. We have to be able to connect those dots. The dots that say, you know, someone who looks like George Floyd is more likely to be brutalized at the hands of law enforcement. That, that somebody who lives in the Bronx is more likely to die, have died of COVID simply because they live where they live and the color of their skin. And those are the kinds of moments of like connecting these dots where we are, are all warriors for equity. We're all warriors in the name of trying to see each other's humanity and to use my favorite superpower, which is empathy. And I think that, you know, I have about a million other things that I want to say, but I want to spare as much time as I can. I think we're going to go at least until 2.15. So maybe we can open up for some questions. Um, I'm happy to tell more stories. Um, you guys have at it. Okay, can everyone hear me? Yes. Great. Um, your comments resonated with your group. Um, so thank you very much. I'll start with this question. You know, diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI, it involves seeking, seeking different perspectives um, and taking a, a difference in people who aren't like yourself. So how would you suggest people broach conversations with people who are different from, from themselves? so that they don't offend, you know, you had given the example, of, you know, where are you really from? How would you suggest uh, we enter into those conversations? Well, that is such a good question. And I think the, the, the biggest umbrella idea is we need to give each other grace, right? Like, that is why I don't love the phrase microaggressions, because I think sometimes people say things and they don't mean to offend you. So they don't mean to be aggression-y. So it's not a microaggression if somebody just misspoke, right? So that's the biggest thing is I think we need to like, everyone needs to take a deep breath, 
give each other space. As I say, I like to inject humor sometimes into it if I can um, gently, because that can sometimes go off the rails too. You have to be a little bit careful. Um, but I think really like, for example, let me give you the specific, like instead of saying, where are you from? The question is, is more like, you know, Oh, um, your last name is Chang. Where is that? Where your where are your ancestors from? Right? Because I could ask the same of just about anyone. Right? Oh, Commissioner Raquel, what an interesting last name. Where are your ancestors from? Right? And that works because that just shows a curiosity in somebody's heritage, which most people are very proud of their heritage. The other thing is we just shouldn't make assumptions. My children are half white and half Korean or a hundred percent Jewish and 50% Korean, as they like to say, you understand that joke, ha ha ha. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, they say that people, they have to code switch all the time that, that people don't know that they're Jewish and they'll say something. And, you know, so that's been kind of tricky or people don't understand that they're Asian and they'll say something, or they do see that they're Asian and they say something. Um, we have, I, I will say one thing, don't let your fear of saying something wrong have you say nothing at all. In other words, don't let the perfect get in the way of the good. Because I will tell you that when the AAPI um, hate was at its highest, I had a couple of African-American friends in the office come up to me and say, you know what, I'm just doing a check-in with you, Juju. I know how hard this is. Um, I hope you're okay. How are you doing? And I started tearing up when they asked me that question. And then I thought, oh my God, that is so nice of you to ask, A. It was so unexpected on some level. And then immediately I turned around and I said, Jasmine, I feel so guilty because I didn't extend the same grace to you when all of the turmoil around George Floyd was happening, right? I just kind of assumed you knew how I felt, right? I just kind of assumed that you knew I care about you and love you and admire you and worry that this must be hard for you, right? But I never said it. And so that was a very important lesson for me to draw about, again, don't let the perfect get in the way of the good. I remember sitting down across from a non-binary actor and, um, and before we started the interview, I said, you know, I'm so sorry, I might accidentally refer to you by the wrong pronoun, you know, da, 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 they is still tricky for me. And they said back to me, Juju, it's okay. You know, if you mm -hmm. misgender me, I know you do it on accident that you respect my, you know, my wishes to be referred to it with they, them pronouns. If you accidentally call me him, I'm not going to take offense to that. It's only somebody who's using that misgendering as a weapon who I get offended by. So if somebody accidentally misspeaks, you can preface it by saying, I'm sorry if I don't mean to offend you. I just wanted to, you know, extend my blah. There's easy ways of inoculating yourself before you take that first step. Thank you so much. You're welcome so much. <laughs> I don't see any other questions. Again, go I ahead. Question. Okay, great. <clears throat> Yeah, I just, this is a question that, and, and I'm really interesting to know you, what your thoughts are since you're, you're uh, you know, you work for, uh, as, a, as a reporter in, in, in journalism and, and all this. And um, several, many years ago, not many, there's several years ago, it was revealed that Julie Chen, I don't know if you remember this, that she was um, asked to, she's another um, uh, television news anchor and television host, and she was asked to have her eyes, um, actually plastic surgery in her eyes to make her look less Asian. Um, and she actually went through with it. And I'm just curious what your thoughts are about that. I don't know if you remember that story. I, I, I vaguely do. And, you know, it's funny. I have been misidentified as Julie Chen in newspapers. <laughs> um, so I know exactly. And, and I've met her over the years and she's lovely. Um, listen, I'm one of those people who believes that if it, you, you do what makes you feel good. Right. So if you want to get a little nip, a little tuck, a little, you know, injection, you, you be you. And, and if you do it in the right reasons, if you're not doing, you know, if you're doing it because it's going to make you feel better, it's going to improve your, you know, um, uh, your, your self image and your self worth. That's great. Um, I do wonder, and I, and I don't know so much about Julie Chen, but I do look at 
for example, Korean soap opera stars, right? I mean, look at the, the K-pop, K-drama stars, right? So many of them are nipped and tucked into perfection that in some ways it kind of erases not only their individuality, but it kind of erases their ethnic flavoring, right? I mean, I've had, I've heard older actresses say, no one can be cast as an older woman because nobody has wrinkles on their forehead. Everybody's gotten them Botox off, right? So no one can play older roles in, so, in a funny way. I, I, I find that with Asian American actors, some of them have been told like, we, we can't cast you in historical Korean um, dramas because you have modern day plastic surgery and it shows. And so to me, I'm, I'm bringing all this up because there are a lot of questions about what is it that you want to represent yourself, right? It's the same kind of thing about these like um, TikTok filters. Like, what do you want? How do you want to, you know, represent yourself? Do you want to be the real you? Do you want to be the imperfect you? Which I think imperfection is what makes us all unique and, and valuable because we don't all want to be cookie cutters, right? We want to stand out and be different. And, you know, it's funny. I told the story about when I was little, I taped, scotch taped my nose because I wanted it to be bigger. And I think, thank God I never changed it, you know, because people to this day are like, oh, that's so distinctive. And I'm like, really? You like my nose? I spent so much of my time hating it, right? But if I were 15 and asked, would you like plastic surgery? I would have been like, yes, you know? And, and I think that's why today I look back and I'm like, well, maybe you should wait. Maybe you should like grow into your, you know, yourself first emotionally before you change yourself physically. Thank you. Juju. Yeah. Yes. Oh, go ahead, Kurt. No, that's okay. I, 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 Juju, how, what would you say to this audience about the intergenerational conflict uh, within the Asian American Pacific Islander um, culture. And what I mean by that is you have an older generation that if we were to use an adjective, their uh, identities, their, their personalities, their very spirits are to be docile, uh, not from a deficit model, it's just they're, they're, they're that part of the culture with an emerging uh, generation that see the intersectionality between Black Lives Matter, uh, the labor movement, um, several other movements, uh, and we'll speak back to this moment, right? And so uh, what would you say to this audience about how that plays out and how that divide could actually be broken where the older generation can understand, hey, our suffering is tied to the suffering over here and there's an intersectionality with that. And then also for the younger generation to not have deference towards uh, their elders, but to understand why they're just like, listen, let's just close the door. Let's not make any waves. We're not going to respond to a phone call from Chad or Kurt. We're just going to put our head down and just do the things that we're accustomed to doing. I know that's a lot to unpackage, but just wanted to see if you could frame that out for the time that we have. Chad, your um, multiple graduate degrees um, are showing. <laughs> um, it's such an astute question. Um, but Kurt's question was great too. Everybody is asking such great questions. This is awesome. Um, I tell stories about this all the time because a lot of that came to play, right? Uh, or came home to roost or whatever metaphor you want to do during 2021 and 2020. Um, because you're absolutely right. The younger generation is loud and proud and uh, taking to the streets and, you know, uh, painting banners. Um, and the older generation is like, Shh, keep your head down. Don't make a ruckus, you know, don't, you know, there's a, there's a, uh, an old proverb in China, I'm not Chinese, but it's a Chinese proverb, like the, the, the nail that gets, sticks out gets hammered, right? So don't stick out, don't call attention to yourself, don't, you know, raise a ruckus. And I was listening, I was interviewing Olivia Munn, right? Who's the Hollywood actress, um, just had a baby with John, John Mulvaney, but I digress. Anyway, she, um, she, was talking about her Vietnamese American mother. She said, I was raised by a single mother, Vietnamese war refugee. And she said she kind of got used to being treated like a second class citizen in the United States. And again, keep your head down. Don't do, you know, uh, don't, don't raise attention to yourself. But one of her friend's mothers was attacked in Queens 
kicked across the way and, and had, had like stitches across her forehead. And her friend went to her, his mom and said, mom, you have to report this crime. And she was like, no, 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 no can do. Right. And he gently convinced her that it would, it would be empowering to do just that. And again, she didn't speak good English, right? The witnesses didn't speak good English. She ended up finally speaking to the police and the NYPD, and I'm sure Philly has the same thing, is that you need an Asian American task force because there are like 43 languages that Asian Americans speak. Beyond that, there are 55, 60 different countries that we come from, 80 different countries. On top of that, there are multiple cultural traditions within those countries. This is a very heterogeneous you know, group, even though we're lumped in together, right? And so the Asian, then the same thing with Bill McCary, even though she's lived in the United States for 20 years, they spent, sent a Tagalog speaking NYPD police officer to talk to her. And it gave her the comfort to really speak out, right? And after um, Olivia Munn's friend's mom pressed charges, they arrested the guy, they charged him with a hate crime, and she felt empowered. And I saw something on TikTok where there's an Indian American kid, you know, like a super cool kid with like, you know, cool hair and cool kicks. And, and he said, you know, here's the problem. Our parents were willing to be silent and to take it, you know, that that was the Uncle Sam tax that we had to pay for coming to this country. He said, but my generation, my generation was, we took AP history. We understand political science. We have the audacity to believe that we deserve equal protection under the law, that we deserve you know, uh, equal rights and, and equal access. And, and that is why we are gently and respectfully taking our parents to the police station, telling them to report because they're the ones who are so vulnerable. And we are raised to be deferential to our elders, listen to our elders, don't push them around, don't tell them what to do. But in this instance, we're girding them to stand up for themselves in a way that they haven't before. So the, it's such a great question. Chad, and, and, and it is reverberating right now throughout the API community. And, and there is, you know, my, the foundation that I started, the um, Korean American Community Foundation, it was pretty much launched by uh, 15 mid-career professionals like myself, right? At the time, it was 25 years ago, we were knuckleheads. We didn't know what we were doing. We were just starting out in our careers. And the Korean ambassador came to us and said, you got to help your community. And we're like, what? Say what? Huh? And we banded together with first generation small business owners who had, you know, had a certain amount of power that they were able to, you know, get together the Korean grocers and so on and so forth. But we were able to match them with legal services, social services, um, the kinds of programming that that the Human Rights C Commission, I'm sure, deals with all the time, right? And and that was our um, our goal was to have an intergenerational approach. And you're absolutely right, Chad, that that the older generation is far more conservative when it comes to questions of racial equity. There's a, there has been historically tensions between the Asian American community and the African American community. And frankly, that is another one of the really sinister aspects of the model minority myth, because often Asian Americans groups are pitted against African American groups or, or Hispanic groups by saying, why can't you be more like Asian Americans? Why can't you lift yourselves out of poverty and all end up at Harvard Business School? And the truth is, I, as I pointed out to you earlier, we are not there. This is a myth. It's not true. 18% of our population lives in grinding intergenerational poverty where there is, you know, uh, high rates of undocumented status, high rates of uninsured. And yet that that then creates conflict within um, these communities. And that's why it's important to like pull back the curtain on these fault lines, really, and speak with honesty you know, about the distrust and frankly, the prejudice between the two communities, right? I mean, I grew up with parents who, who were very xenophobic, right? Who were very insular, even at the same time that they were being discriminated against by mainstream American society, they were 
having their own, you know, sort of biases against other groups. So, you know, it's a very complicated, you know, uh, interconnected, um, as you say, intersectionality that we need to unpack. Thank you. Do we have You're time welcome. for any more questions? Sorry. Commissioner Yinks looks like she has her hand up. Yes, I do. Thank you, Marty. Um, I don't have a question to you, but I just want to tell you that your presentation was unbelievable. Um, forgive me because I am very emotional about it. Because as you spoke, I could not help but go through my own life and the things that I have gone through. Even though I wasn't born in Puerto Rico, I am an American citizen by birth. And yet people ask me the same questions that they ask you. Where you come from? How come you have an accent? You know, all those questions that are unbelievably ignorant, but that everybody asks you. I wish I had in my hands the many times that people have asked my daughter, how come you're white when your mother is Puerto Rican? So thank you so much for such an inspiring uh, presentation. And as I say, I'm sorry that I am emotional about it, but it's very dear to my heart. Thank you so much. Oh, Commissioner, you just made my day. How lovely of you to say that and such high praise. Thank you so much. Now I'm getting emotional. Thank you. And, and I would like to say that, you know, with regards to what Commissioner Yang's just shared, um, I would encourage her to not wipe her eyes. Um, I would encourage her to let the tears fall. I think that when we at the PHRC talk about a beloved community, it's about being vulnerable. It's about being hyper vulnerable. It's about what Juju said, extending a grace to one another, but it's also about acknowledging those racial elephants in the room. It's about acknowledging whether they're micro or macro, whether it's uh, white supremacy, whether it's anti-Semitism. Um, we all come to every, uh, to all contexts with a pretext and that context oftentimes is a form of human brokenness. And so as we conclude today, I want us to take away everything that Juju shared with us, but it's one word that just resonates with me. And that word is that every day we should try to gird ourselves about, gird ourselves up on the left hand side, on the right hand side, in front of us and in back of us to make sure that we're fighting the true enemy, which is the enemy of hate in the state of Pennsylvania and within our democracy. And that each and every day, we take to uh, this level of reinventing our humanity so that we can also deal with our ownisms uh, because we have them. Uh, to be human is to have failings and strivings. And so we leave this beloved community space honoring everything that Dr. Yang said, honoring all of you who remain present for the time that you got on this uh, virtual format and the time that we're gonna leave. And we thank you, Juju, for your multiple identities and the authenticity and the way that you, in an organic, fluid manner, brought this presentation to the PHRC. We do these PHRC social justice lecture series, these Women History Month events, Pride events, African American History or Heritage Month event, Latino events. We do it all because we want to be able to inform the Commonwealth that as much hate that there may be, there's a unifying theme that will continue to emerge from the PHRC. And so we're an ending, not just trying to do things in the Commonwealth, but we believe that in order to be successful as a human relations commission moving forward into the future, we have to connect the Commonwealth with a global initiative movement. Because as you so eloquently stated, we're all interconnected, intertwined, because we're all human beings. Thank you so much. Thank you. And everyone have a great day. Thank you for inviting me. This was such a sacred space. I really appreciate it. Thank you so day, much for everybody. presenting. Thank you. Thank you so much, Juju. Thank Wonderful. you.